Welcome to Our Next Existence by Katie and the Chorus. I'm Katie, former technology strategist turned reluctant spiritual medium, and I channel messages from the Chorus, a group of beings just beyond our sensory perceptions who are loving, expansive, and who greatly enjoy sharing their perspective of us. Join us each week as we share and discuss their ideas about humanity's existence, purpose, and future. Concepts you can draw from to accelerate your path, expand your perceptions, and ultimately step into the flow of the universe and your life. All roads lead to potato chips. Do you have a food like that? God, potato chips are mine. I can be stressed, happy, bored, really hungry, and always potato chips will sound good. (laughs) When this year started to get crazy, I was like, you know, I just really don't want to run out of potato chips at a time like this. And I kept not being able to find them at my local grocery store. So I started ordering them by the case from Amazon. And these giant boxes would show up on our porch because, you know, you don't want to crush them. They're big bags of potato chips. And there's like 12 potato chip bags in a box. I'd take it, this giant box down to the basement and start stashing my potato chips. But then I kind of noticed I was going through them like a lot faster. And it was like, oh, maybe it's a good thing to run out of your food obsession every now and then. <laughs> Been a bit of a bumpy year, hasn't it? Some highs and some lows and everything in between. We're going to talk about that today. As is the custom, in the first part of this episode, you'll hear directly from the chorus. And then afterwards, we will integrate and talk about what they said. So grab a potato chip, sit back, relax, and enjoy a message from the chorus. We have much to discuss with you today, for this is just the beginning. There are so many understandings to come. There are so many awakenings, epiphanies, realizations to come. In the beginning, you did not have the ability to know yourselves as you do today. Today, you are aware of much that humanity tends to do. You are aware of your tendencies. You are aware of your proclivities. There are habits about humanity that you are beginning to understand. There was a time not that long ago when you did not yet have these concepts about yourselves, for you had not moved any distance at all away from the frequency of the game and of the experience that you were having. Therefore, it would have been difficult for you to craft a perspective about yourselves, about what humanity is or is like. Therefore, we consider those first movements off of the frequency, specifically of the game, to be, in a sense, the starting point of your awakening. Though we would like to point out that you were never not going to awaken, therefore you were never not awakening. Some of the habits of humanity you know quite well. There is a sense, there is a feeling of what it means to be in contact with a human. Humans tend to get very specific about things in order to understand them. If a new concept is brought to you, you think about that concept. And in thinking about that concept, you typically break it apart, categorize it, look at it from different vantage points, recategorize it, and connect it to other things in your context. In so doing, what you are actually accomplishing energetically is an alignment of that new concept into the existing structure of the game. That is to say, 
you often take things that are new and transform them into something that is just ever so slightly different than everything that has already come before. In doing this, what you accomplish is a similarity between moment to moment to moment. There is not much that changes in your reality. There is not much that drastically alters in your perception. You tend to look relatively the same the entire length of your lifetimes. Though you see a drastic difference in wrinkles or in curved posture or in gray hair, these things are very specific and very slight. You do not change your physical form moment by moment as you so desire. You are yourself, as you would say, through the length of your lifetime. Your environment also does not change very drastically throughout the course of your existences. Though you see storms or earthquakes or floods, it is not necessarily that earth fundamentally alters and is unrecognizable from one month to another. Your continents stay relatively in the same place, Your mountains stay relatively in the same place. Though there may be erosion and there may be movement, this happens over the course of many millions of years and therefore is not, until recently, even perceptible by a human in the course of their lifetime. It is not until recently, as you have found greater and greater evidence of these shifts over epics that you were not there to witness, that you have come to understand the vastness of other timescales and your perception or lack of perception of these things that are moving and changing all around you. It is no coincidence, beloved ones, that you are coming across this evidence, that you are coming to know these things, that you are witnessing in your way, in your time period, the changes of the universe, of the solar system, of your planet, and of your environment. As you expand, you will recognize in yourselves a greater allowance for change. That is, It will seem less disruptive to your being to recognize that there are things in your existence, in your reality, in your societies that are changing. This may be difficult to conceive of as there is a great deal of change happening right now across all of your countries on your planet. And at times this seems very disconcerting, very unsettling dangerous, and perhaps even perilous. But understand that the changes that you are now allowing yourselves to witness are magnitudes more than you have done in epics past. Compared to where you were many millennia ago, your changes right now that you are manifesting and witnessing are drastic indeed. You are allowing yourselves to change your own format more often. You are allowing yourselves to change your commitments to different institutions, to different ideas, to different groups and communities far more often. And therefore, you are giving yourselves the space to explore and to allow in more of what you each are. We understand that right now there could be many things that you could focus your perceptions upon and activate belief systems of risk and lack of control. And here, beloved ones, we would like to point out to you that from our vantage point, there is no such thing as not in control. Where we are in the flowing energy, all things are infinitely, effortlessly in control, and that the idea of lack 
of control, of loss of control, is your idea. It is your belief system and it is part, a powerful part, of your experience here. You will find in the days and weeks to come that you have, perhaps, less and less concerns being activated about lack of control and more and more trust in the idea that things might work out in ways that you cannot predict or plan for. This is an important sensation for energetically, it is a choice that you are making. In that choice that you are making between a concern about a loss of control or a release of that concern and a trust instead that it might still work out in ways you cannot predict, you are subtly choosing the difference between the frequency of the existing game and the frequency of the new belief systems the new frequencies towards which you are heading. Is it all right still from time to time to have powerful experiences of loss of control? Yes, absolutely. For as we have mentioned, there is a part of you that is still active in the game and a part of you that is expanding outward. Therefore, you are not shifting away from the game. Rather, your consciousness is expanding to perceive as much of the game as you wish and as much of these new and expansive frequencies that you are moving towards as you wish. From the five senses standpoint, from the standpoint of your game, you will find a need to prevent and to stop that which you do not like. Therefore, remember that each time you feel a need to push against your own reality, you are simply viewing it from the lens of the five senses belief systems, from the belief systems of your game. It is a powerful strategy to energize, to maintain the structure of limitation here. For each player, including you yourself, are infinitely connected to energy. Thus, new energy is flowing towards you into the game all the time, bringing abundance and newness and life and creation with it. Therefore, you and your fellow players must constantly filter that energy into the perception of disallowance, lack, and limitation. You do this through a great number of mechanisms that have been manifested by way of your vibrating with this frequency. One such mechanism, most evidently, is your need to push against the limitation of the game itself. And in so doing, you energize that limitation. You activate that limitation. As you reflect on this, you will understand that you have a great many beliefs that push against that limitation. Colossal, galactic beliefs that are still predominantly unconscious to your game piece being. These beliefs will tell you that all things are by default out of control without your vigilance without your management of them. You must check in on things. You must maintain things. You must control things. You must also prevent and protect yourself from things. These beliefs are not something to be thwarted. They are not something to be disassembled. They are a perfect monumental, extraordinary construct of what you have built here. Therefore, you do not need to push against yourself in your day-to-day life and say, oh, this feels out of control, but 
I shouldn't feel like things are out of control. I know now that I should feel like things are in control. This is not so, beloved ones. You should absolutely feel like things are out of control when you are present in the perspective of the game itself. The game is perfect. The game has brought you and many others much expansion. Rather, when things feel out of control, allow them to be so. Watch what happens when things go out of control. Be patient in their unfolding and be gentle on yourself. Soften your need to fix, to stop, and to prevent. Roll with it a little bit more perhaps than you might have usually. And in so doing, quite simply, what you are doing is choosing ever so slightly a different frequency and a different vantage point. And that vantage point is one of love and allowance. You have created a masterpiece here. Therefore, all things that you are awakening to doing and being as part of being a human are masterful. From our vantage point, at least. We love you infinitely, and we will speak with you soon. I think for the most part, listening to Bible stories as a child, I was kind of confused. I understood the general messages, but there were some of the specifics of the stories that sort of baffled me at times. One story that stands out the most to me as a kid as always being super confusing. There are a couple stories in the Bible where essentially people are told by God that they've been chosen to do something. There's a few examples of this. And those individuals react by running away and hiding. (laughs) And as a kid, I remember sitting there sort of mystified that, man, why would you run away from such certainty? I mean, wouldn't it be pretty great if there was a deity and that deity said, this will be your job. And if the deity believes you can do it, I mean, surely you can do it. And so I was, I always wondered like, why weren't they like celebrating and like, yeah, now I don't have to go through life and figure out what it is that I'm meant for. I got, I got a message straight from the top. Why did they run away and hide? Destiny is one of those words among humans that I think can have two very different connotations depending how you feel about it. It can be like destiny, dun, 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 like inescapable, unavoidable. Like no matter what you did or have done or will do, it's your destiny to face this bad guy or bring about this destruction or whatever. But then we also spend, I think, a fair amount of time wishing or trying to find our life's purpose. We all love the idea that we were uniquely put here with a unique role, that sense of fulfillment where the trueness of what you are spills forth. It's like a expanding into all that you are and being all that you are at the same time. Destiny. Yeah, this is it. This is my destiny. This is what I was always meant to do. 
I spent a lot of time in my young adult life in particular trying to figure out what the heck it was I quote unquote wanted to do. I took job tests and personality quizzes. I mean, over and over, multiple times over decades. And it was interesting to see how it changed. How the suggestions for what I was uniquely capable for changed. I traveled all over the world. I tried all different jobs, and I mean dozens of different jobs. And it wasn't until, I don't know, 25 years into the course of my career that I was able to look back at a path that would seem to have been all over the place. And I mean, between marketing and writing and science and data and business and government and nonprofits. I mean, I'm serious. You name it, I did it. I think everything except for medicine. I never really went in that direction. And I don't even know how I made my resume make sense between different job applications, but somehow I did. And somehow I always got another job. And it wasn't until I was about more than two decades into my career that I had a moment of epiphany one day at my job. And I realized that all those jobs that seemed so different and all over the place had actually several things in common. And one of those things was that it was always about the unknown. Whatever division, whatever department, whatever company, whatever product, I somehow always gravitated towards a thing that was brand new, that was undefined, or that people did not know what to do with. And I played different roles in those positions, but I was completely unconscious to the fact that that's what I was doing. I was just now getting a job as a marketer or now I felt like being in data and tech or now I felt like moving into aerospace. I was very much in the moment and did not understand a conscious arc of what that was. Now, is that destiny? Was I destined to always somehow find myself in places where things are deeply unknown? And if that's true, then was I always destined to somehow turn into this spiritual medium where I am standing constantly at the brink of things that are unknown? Early on in my communications with the chorus, they told me that I had a job, essentially. It wasn't something that I needed to go do. They brought to consciousness, they pointed out, they reflected to me a job I had already been doing. Now, if you have voices in your head (laughs) that are suggesting to you that you have a divine purpose, you might freak out a little bit. You might say, this isn't real. Is this real? You might run away and hide kind of like those people in the Bible. And I did. (laughs) I absolutely ran and hid. I absolutely avoided it. In fact, for years, I didn't tell anybody what was happening. And you know what? I still haven't. I have started making a podcast about this stuff before some of the people who are closest to me in my life have heard about this or know that this is what's happening. Because it's scary. Because I don't know what it is. And I'm not sure how to describe it. Because it feels completely out of my control. The chorus today brought up the topic of control, but they brought it up in an important context. They said, okay, so we started with consciousness And you are a consciousness. You are a being. You are you. You can expand your consciousness infinitely. You can narrow it infinitely. And you chose to narrow it to these frequencies of disallowance in which you can give yourself the experience of the perception of a lack of energy, of insufficiency, of loss. And they said, 
one of the first manifestations that you created by resonating with these frequencies was a belief. And that belief begot more beliefs and more beliefs until finally what you find yourselves in today is what we see, what we call a belief system complex, a large architecture that is dynamic, it's moving, it's growing, and it is constantly creating your reality. This is what they call mind. This is what they believe is our conception of this experience that we're having where we think and we judge all day long is actually the unconscious dynamic action of the belief system in creating the experience that we wanted to have here. And if you'd like more information on that, go back and listen to episodes two and three. And so today they said, let's look around. Let's look at what's in this belief system complex. What is it that is creating your reality? And they said, you might already be starting to awaken to this stuff, that you're starting to get a sense of what it means to be human in a way. And they said, this is possible because you're starting to expand. Awakening is expansion from a point of great limitation. And as we expand off the game, in that space, we turn around and we look at it and we say, hey, what the hell's that? (laughs) Holy moly, we really did that stuff over and over again. We really believed that. That's really how we behaved. That's really what we thought. That's really how we saw the universe. And that experience of becoming conscious of what you have always been what was always there, but maybe you weren't aware of it, is the experience of awakening. And so they said, let's have a look around. And the first sort of area of the belief system complex they're pointing out to us is beliefs in control, or more specifically, beliefs in not in control. Because as they pointed out, that is a creation of this reality of this experience of our game. Outside of the game, as they suggested, where they are, there is no such thing as not in control. Everything is infinitely and perfectly in control. How could it be otherwise is a perspective they might have. And here, fundamental to our existence is this idea that things can be not in control. And they said, you're starting to get it, right? You're looking around and you're saying, "Woo! you don't have to tell me twice, Chorus. I see it. Things are not in control. We've got a pandemic. People are protesting and angry. Governments are toppling. There's war. Our environment is in chaos. Like, this isn't really big news. I get it. Things are not in control. And they're saying, yes, but also a human would view those things as not in control. And you might say, what? Back up the truck. Are you telling me that I think a pandemic, environmental upheaval, protests, social unrest, is out of control because I'm a human and that someone else from a different belief system would not see those things as not in control? Yes, actually, because that's their perspective. One of the things that the chorus used to tell me that really pissed me off, (laughs) especially when I was having a hard time in my life, was you're doing it perfectly. Everything is going perfectly. It's unfolding beautifully. And I would say, no, it's not. Look at this. Look at my life. Look at what happened in the world today. Look at my health. That is not going well. And they would say, we can understand that perspective. 
particularly at a specific moment in time where you stop and you look around and you say, no, this is not what I wanted. (laughs) This is not what I wanted it to be. Children are so good at this. It's very exacerbated in young children because they're just stepping into these beliefs of not in control. Get around a small child and then tell them to do something that they don't want to do. And the reaction is fierce. So there I was, like a five-year-old with my, or like a two-year-old. I mean, gosh, they do it early. With my hands crossed across my chest and my chin stuck out and saying to the chorus, no not what I wanted. (laughs) But they were pointing out something interesting, which is that our ideas of control are intricately related to the concept of time. Time is one of those fundamental underlying engines of the game, which really connects to every single aspect of our belief system complex. And we'll spend a lot more time time, talking about time, as awkward as that sounds. But the point is that to humans, there is a process that we go through when we do feel in control. And let's talk about that. Because if we're going to talk about why we think things are not in control when, according to the chorus, they are, then what happens when we do feel in control? So if you'll notice, most humans feel in control when something they have mentally conjured plays out on the frequencies of the five senses. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're planning a big event and you make your to-do list and you send out the invitations and you coordinate the, the site, the event location, the music, the et cetera. You've got your checklist for the day, and then the event plays out exactly as you thought it would. That feeling, that sense of, yes, this is the way it was supposed to go down, is what we would call a sense of control. Everything went according to plan. Plan being a series of mental thoughts that we had ahead of time, ahead of the event. And they all lined up very perfectly and very neatly. Now, take that same event and on the day of the event, throw in a dozen different things that were not part of the plan. A hurricane, (laughs) a simple rainstorm, a power outage, more people showing up than were invited, the band not showing up when it was invited, etc. And that sense of disruption that sense of I had no mental thought of wanting these things, of welcoming these things ahead of time is what we would call a sense of not of control. So what's happening energetically in those two scenarios? When new energy comes in to our environment, it is filtered through this belief system complex is one way to think of it. So here we all are standing on the game board inside of this bubble, perhaps you might call it, inside of this egg. And the shell of the egg is constructed of the belief systems, of the belief system complex. And so we receive energy infinitely because we are infinitely energetic beings. And so as the energy that we receive is flowing towards us, it passes through all of these belief systems and essentially gets molded into the version of our reality. So pure, pure potential hits the end of the egg and then gets ratcheted into a concept of time and then a concept of time and space, and then a concept of time and space and body and distance, and on and on and on, and also through the belief of not in control. And so when the manifestation arrives in our reality, it plays by all of these rules. 
it says, okay, it could have come through as something totally new and different, but instead it came through as a new pair of shoes. Why? Because we believe we have feet and we believe we wear things on our feet and we believe that you can get new clothes sometimes and we believe that sometimes they can look like this and on and on and on and on. And so something that could have been anything in creation shows up in our manifested reality, in our perception that we have through our five senses and we can see and touch these new shoes. So tying into our existing context is a critical way that these manifestations are able to be received by us. Sometimes we talk about genius in terms of something being really new and really different. An idea, a piece of art, some sort of work that someone created that is really just a step beyond anything that had come before. Now, we could have new and different ideas coming in all the time, truly new and different ideas coming in all the time. But by their definition, if they were actually new and actually different, that would mean that perhaps they had not been molded by our belief systems in the same way. If that were to be true, something could come in that was truly revolutionary, but that something would also potentially not obey the rules of time, the rules of space, the rules of body, the rules of distance, the rules of not in control. And so energetically, what would happen is that a frequency would come all the way in. But by our participation in the game, we've agreed not to allow ourselves to perceive much that is beyond these frequencies. And so if a new frequency really showed up, really made it all the way through, we would take one look at it and either we wouldn't actually even be able to perceive it because it would be off the frequency of our game or we would look at it and just say, no, nah, I don't get it. And collectively, we would sort of just reject it. So if you notice, true genius that we understand and appreciate is a step beyond perhaps what had come before but it still sort of plays by the rules. It's still a painting. It's still using our concepts of gravity and existence. It's still connected in some way to our context. So when you were planning that event and you had all of these delicious thoughts come into you about how you wanted it to go and how it should all unfold, you were receiving new energy. But with each manifestation, you were also tying that energy into an existing context. So, of course, there would be people. Of course, there would be a building. Of course, they would all be held down to earth by lovely gravity, right? You're envisioning how it will go. And in your vision of how it will go, you are reinforcing the belief systems of the game. And so that sense of control that we have energetically, we would call a sense of fit. It feels like control to us because it fits very nicely and very neatly in the existing context. This is energy that has been perfectly molded into all of the limitations that we agreed here to participate in. And so that perfectly planned event, that sense that we have of perfectly planned is a sense of fit with the existing frequencies of the game. So then, what the heck is something that's not in our control? And even in my example, I gave sort of not great things, right? When we think about something that is not in our control, 
it's usually stuff you don't want to have happen. So a hurricane, a rain out, the band not showing up, at face value, you would say, oh man, that's awful. But energetically, what's happening with things that we might call out of our control? And on the continuum, you might say there are pleasant surprises that are out of our control, but then there's just stuff that we would have wished would not have happened. Humanity's beliefs and not in control dovetail very nicely with manifestations that we might call chaos. That is because a human in our belief system complex, in the way that we like to exist here, we do not often wish for things that cause sudden disruptions because we believe we live in an environment of finite energy, of limitation. And so disruption requires a greater expenditure of energy. It requires new and different solutions. It requires a whole lot more that seems unpredictable and out of our control. And so it's not often that you find a human that says, you know what I hope happens tomorrow? I hope my entire life goes out of control. I hope I get fired. You know what would be great next week would be if I got in a car accident. I know, I know what we're missing here. We're missing a drought. That would really be great. Because all of these things that we can think of have one characteristic in common, and it is that it might require more energy expenditures. It might require things that we can't plan on. If there's a drought, you're going to have to do things differently. If there's a car crash, you're going to be put on a different path. If you get fired, you're going to have to find a new and different job. And so the things that we typically would call out of our control are things that are disruptive. Disruptive in the sense of energetically requiring us to step outside of the existing dynamic action of the belief systems. Let me explain this a little bit further. So the new energy is coming into the belief system complex, and we've already seen the example where it gets molded, 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 and then it turns into something that you completely expected and planned on. Fits. Clink. Right in like a puzzle piece. It just snaps right into all the belief systems, all the things that are already going on in your life. Okay. So now let's say a wavelength of new energy is going through the belief systems and somehow it finds a shortcut. It doesn't quite get filtered in the same way. It isn't quite as ratcheted down. It is truly new and it is truly expansive, and it is truly different. It still has to play by the rules, though. It isn't completely outside the bounds of our game, because otherwise we wouldn't allow ourselves to perceive it. It's somewhere in the middle. And so, as it manifests, we perceive that thing as a disaster, and it can choose from any of the long list of things that we would deem to be unwanted. Anything from an unpleasant surprise to complete chaos. And so it comes in, in that format, in that way. But in reality, it is still a version of new and different energy. I know that many of you listening to this right now have experienced this. You have experienced some sort of chaos in your life that completely transformed your life. And when you got down the road from it by some measure of time and you were able to turn around and look at it at a distance, you were able to see, huh, you know, after that happened, my life 
totally turned in a new direction. Now, at the time, you don't have that perspective and that vantage point because you are still immersed in the dynamic action of the belief system, experiencing that thing as the collective would intend it to be experienced, which is disruptive. But as you move forward and away from it, you see a thread. You see an energetic underpinning. You see the larger context that that energy brought in, which was one of newness, which was one of expansiveness. And so if we set the manifestation aside, let's set it to the side for a minute, whatever that chaos was, energetically, that sense of something new that has come through to you, that has navigated all sorts of things and has somehow found a loophole into your life to you. And it's big and it's scary and you're not sure what to do about it. That sense of not in control is the sense of new and different energy. And part of you is immersed in the belief systems of the game and is viewing that new energy from that standpoint where those things are not wanted. Because we came here to experience the limitations of this reality. And so you say, why does something new feel so awful? Why does being not in control feel so awful? And it's because you're awakening to the perspective that you had in the game where those things were not wanted. They disrupted the objectives that you came here to achieve, which was to be limited, to be human, to be judgmental, to perish, to get sick, to experience all of this delicious limitation that is not possible anywhere else in creation. But now your consciousness is expanding. And so there is a part of you that is stepping off the game and saying and realizing and vibrating and understanding of, I do think I want new things. I want to be different. I can imagine a different kind of existence for humanity. I desire things that... I consider to be expansive and changed and fundamentally different than everything I feel like I've experienced before. And it's to that part of you that this new energy is able to reach because you have expanded outward to meet it. And that is the important shift in the perspective It's not necessarily that the energy has found a loophole, potentially, to get through the game and reach you. Actually, it's that you have expanded outward to meet it. For now, while we are awakening, we're both. You are the expanded part of you that is out there coming into contact again with new and abundant and fresh and infinitely loving energy. And there is another part of you that is still present in the game, that is still resistant to change because change was new and abundant and infinitely loving energy, which was not what you came here to experience, the perception of. So now we go back to what the chorus said, which is, you view these things as out of control because you are a human active in those belief systems. And from their vantage point, Those things are not out of control. There is no such thing as not in control. You've expanded to a place of loving wavelengths. And from that place, you are bringing 
drastically new and different energy into your life. And they said, well, this is the experience of conscious awakening. You are expanding outward, meaning there is a part of you that is still present in that narrow perception while the rest of you expands outward. You get the benefit of both. You get to see each of these experiences from two very different but very expansive perspectives. And so does the chorus think that car crash was out of control? No. Do they think the riots, the pandemic, the environment, anything that we're manifesting is out of control? Nope. Because they see the larger context. They see us for what we are, energetic beings who chose to narrow to a very specific frequency for the expansive purpose of that experience. And so anything and everything that we manifest while we are here is a perfect achievement of those goals. And there's a part of you that is probably starting to sense this too. That when you sense something coming in your life that feels unknown, that feels out of control, there is a part of you that knows that that's going to be big and transformative and also loving and probably expansive and maybe a lot like all those other challenges you've already come through that have propelled you to new places in your life. And then there is also a perspective alive within you that will tell you that that is going to be bad, that you need to prepare for it, that it's really scary, that it feels really scary to sense that something is coming over which you are not sure if you have control. The chorus has never said, the expanded place that we are all going to is better. In fact, what they express to me time and time again is how beautiful and how perfect what we created here is. I think as I've reflected on this journey and as I've come to keep an ear open for how other people talk about their own journeys. I've heard a lot of analogies that seem to suggest we leave all this behind. In uh, New Age spirituality, I've, I've heard terms like we're moving into the fifth dimension or the fourth dimension. I forget which number it is, but we are leaving the third dimension. We are out of here. (laughs) Move it on to better places. I mean, I think classic religion has a lot of this too. And in Christianity, you know, we always talk about ascending into heaven. We're going to go up to heaven. There's even a direction. It's up. It's up there somewhere. We're going up to heaven. There's a lot of, we're, we're experiencing this earthly life and One day when we arrive, there's a place in heaven, it'll all make more sense or our good deeds and our virtues will be rewarded. We just, we just got to get there. We just got to live through this and then get there. And interestingly, Jesus always talked about heaven on earth. He always talked about, no, it comes here. And we were always like, yeah, okay, we'll see you in heaven. And he's like, no, heaven on earth, heaven comes here. And then we would say, Yeah, okay, if you had to give us a list, what do we have to do to get into heaven again? (laughs) I mean, even in science, there's this concept, isn't there, of leaving something that's not working and moving forward? I mean, evolution kind of has this sense to it, doesn't it? As organisms, we evolve. Like, we get better adapted to our environment than we were before. Like we change, we become more. 
And there's this sense that like this version of the organism that was gets left, left behind evolution. I mean, even physicists have this, the big bang. I mean, it all expands outward. You're moving, you're moving forward through space. You're moving onward. There's stuff out there that we want to go see. There's stuff that we want to go move towards and leave this other stuff behind. I mean, how many people are like, let's go build Mars colonies so that we can leave this poor, awful, broken planet behind. And and then everybody's like, who gets chosen? Who gets to go to the new colony? What's the best human? The chorus doesn't think there's anything that we need to leave. There's nothing we need to reject. There's nothing we need to undo or leave behind. They think it's perfect. They think it's all perfect and infinitely worthy of being loved. And I think that's it, right? Isn't that awakening? Isn't that what we're doing? We're seeing how it could all be perfect. Isn't it kind of like me where I thought I had this career path that was all over the place? Just jumping from place to place to place to place, experiencing different things and different things. And then when I finally got far enough along, I could turn around and I could look at it and I could see how it was actually all connected. And from that vantage point, I can appreciate it. I could never have planned for it. I could never have plotted out. First, I'll have this random job and then I'll have this random job and then I'll go here. And then magically, I'll meet someone at a coffee shop and they'll give me this other job. And then somehow it'll all orchestrate into this career where I had experience after experience of the unknown. Nope. I could not have thought about that in advance because it wouldn't have fit. The person that I was then at the start of my career could not have foreseen these things had not grown into the person that I was becoming. You guys, I see it too. I see the pandemic. I see the pollution. I see the wars. I see the strife. I see the frustration and the heartache in my friends. I get it. And I understand that these things could be viewed as being out of control. And that perspective is completely valid. And that perspective is perfect and is everything we came here to do. But also, I do believe that if we go just a little bit further down the path, we'll be there and we'll get to that point where we can turn around and look at it all and see how it all makes sense. so much for listening. We hope you found these messages to be helpful. May they accelerate you on your path wherever you'd like it to go. For more information, check out our website at katieandthechorus.com. There you will find show quotes, episode transcripts, details on our book, The Book of Human Awakening, as well as our newsletter sign up. Visit katieandthechorus.com. Thanks again. See you next time.